Yes. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to present our next speaker, Tada Atong. She is the founder and president of Jack Rabbit Development LLC. So without further ado, Tada, take it away. Thank you. Thank you all for staying till the end. I know some of you would rather be on a beach, hopefully using the bathing suits that we never used. Um, I would actually first like to say thank you to the staff here at the Native American Learning Center. Right? Can we give them a round of applause? They've done a great job hosting us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's an honor to get to be here. And um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Tata. And I'm going to talk, hopefully, about the sustainability side, because I know we've heard a lot about energy, but my passion is really about sustainability. Um, so I get the great pleasure of talking to you about projects that I had no involvement in, just, just we throw it out, that out there. But um, I was asked to present on different sustainability projects that I'm aware of going on in Indian country. And I was really excited when I got asked to do this because frankly, I was in a bit of a rut and kind of hitting my head and going like, I really need some inspiration. So this led to a lot of inspiration for me um, to get to just kind of review what the amazing work that all of you all are doing. So for all of you in the energy sector, thank you for all the work that you're doing and for all the policy people, for all the changes you've been making. Um, and for the rest of us who care about sustainability, I just kind of want to go over some of the sustainability goals. I don't think we talk about these enough when we talk about sustainability. We tend to really have a focus on just energy. But as you can see, there are 17 other goals when it, um, you're looking at sustainability that the United Nations has essentially defined. So I'm actually going to read them for you because I really want to impress on you all the ability to be really wide in your perspective, in your scope, and hopefully challenge and empower you all to take some of this back to your communities and to start thinking on a larger level as opposed to in silos about energy and sustainability. Because as you all know as natives, we all know it's interconnected, but I don't think we're taking that approach as much as we should be. Um, so as you can see, the 17 goals are no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and partnerships for the goals. So I'm really hoping from all of this we take away that bit about partnerships because we're not going to achieve any of this if we don't start working together to get there. So I have a really nice sticker here made by a native person for someone who wants to tell me, and I bet this is a really elementary question for most of you, but I don't think we talk about it enough. What are the three keys to survival? Yeah, you go ahead. Food, energy, water, maybe? Air, food, air, water? Close. Close, okay, hold on. Okay, George? another one over here. I'll say food, medicine, and shelter. You could go with medicine if we talk about food in, in that sense, but it's food, shelter, and water. Food, shelter, and water are the three basic keys to survival. So again, no disrespect to the energy people, but I can't eat my iPhone, and when the grid goes down, the, the real thing that people need is food, shelter, and water in order to make it through that grid outage. So we're not talking enough about these other things when it comes to sustainability. Water is a key thing. We really need to be talking about it more. So I'll just go on from there. We're gonna I win by default. Yeah. I win by default, the sticker. No? She, <laughs> she gets to go first. She, you know, she, so she's the she, winner. She raised her hand first. So okay, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Here you also, go. yeah. Done by a native artist, so circulating the economy, which we're going to get to. So uh, the projects that I really want to highlight touch on four, potentially five of these goals, which are zero hunger, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, and sustainable cities and communities. And these are all projects that are being done and have currently been done around Indian country. And I'm actually shocked to hear that some people have not heard of them, so I feel, feel kind of cool about that. Um, so the first off is this indigenous food renaissance, and I apologize, I don't know how to spell, and I didn't catch my incorrection there. But um, has anybody gotten to go to the sous chef's new restaurant, Awamni? 
few in the back. Yeah, those, for, those of you from Minnesota, awesome. I'm just gonna say, if you haven't gotten the chance to go to Awamni in Minnesota and Minneapolis, you all should really check it out because it's not just about supporting another native, it's about really reconnecting to the foods that a lot of us know as children and have kind of started to lose because we're not necessarily promoting that type of food renaissance. And so across the country, we're seeing the sort of this renaissance of food in restaurants like Awamni. Also, uh, the indigenous food culture going on at Gojo. Has anyone been out to White River at White Mountain Apache? No, yeah, one, okay, awesome. Well, if you all go out there, you really should check out Gojo. They're doing tons of indigenous food, but they're also using their rehabilitation, so their workforce development and rehabilitation to integrate them back in, train them on new skills so that they create purpose for their lives and give them a skill they can walk away with, while also providing really healthy indigenous and organic foods to their community. And for instance, you can get an $8 steak salad going on there, which is absolutely delicious. So it makes it accessible to people because I think a lot of the times, for instance, a Wamni can be a little bit pricey, but you know, if we don't have access to healthy indigenous foods, we're gonna continue to see the issues that we're seeing, especially when it comes to our health. So for instance, I do a lot of work in Navajo. Three out of four people in Navajo have diabetes. That's not sustainable for us. We should not have diabetes. This is not normal. And type two diabetes is totally controllable through diet and exercise. It's a basic. So it, we don't have to rely on dialysis. What we really need to be doing is regenerating our foods and getting this back into our culture and making it more popular, not just amongst ourselves, but as a way to draw people in and say, well, did you get to try that amazing what uh, the three steak salad, three bean salad, or these amazing sunflower uh, bars up at Awamni. And so really encouraging people to get into food and re rekindle that knowledge, because if we don't, we're going to start losing that knowledge in how to grow some of these foods, how to process some of these foods, and more importantly, how to, to cook with some of these foods as well. So, Along with that food sovereignty, so as you all know, you know, the government really went to a lot of effort to cut off our food resources. I mean, it, it wasn't a mistake that they killed off the buffalo. That was very intentional because you can control people when you control their food. So having food renaissance is really an act of sovereignty. Taking control again of our food sources is an act of sovereignty in that sense. So if you all have been to the grocery store, everyone's been talking about the price of eggs recently. In order to buy free range good eggs, it's almost up to $9 in, in my grocery stores in the Valley. You know, that makes a barrier for a lot of us when it comes to buying quality food. There are tons of studies that show that organic produce is better for you. The lack of the pesticides, the lack of the way that it's grown in big pharma or big farms, you know, that really does have an impact not just on our health, but the health of our communities. And so seeing people that are doing this type of farming and then bringing it into restaurants, such as what they're doing out in White River and White Mountain, it's amazing to see because it directly impacts your community and it gives you, again, that control over your health and well being within your community. So for instance, just bringing in chickens into a farm, got eggs, now you have a way to produce protein, but there are lots of other projects out there that people are looking at, such as hydroponics and aquaponics, and these are all amazing things get, that can really help your community take control of their food sources again. I think all of us kind of got a little taste of that during COVID when we started to see some of the grocery store shelves go empty and it was suddenly a realization that we don't have control over our food at all. And this is a, a way to bring it back and take control of it again. So one of the next projects I'm really excited about um, was done by a company called uh, Industrial Solar. And they worked with the Navajo Nation to go out and install over 300 off-grid systems out in the Navajo Nation. So they essentially brought in power under the CARES Act to people who had never had electricity in their homes. And actually, while I was getting prepared, Fernando had told me that they literally just installed a system yesterday on a mud hut hogan. So traditionally built hogan that now will have electricity for the first time. And these aren't large systems. Um, Here's a little, bit, a, a little bit of a picture on it. Uh, these aren't incredibly large systems. We're not talking about running an HVAC system here. We're talking about 
providing basic amenities to people, such as having a fridge. Again, if people have dialysis and they need insulin, you've got to have a way to keep that cool. But not to mention, if you want to have really good produce and stuff like that, you have to have a way to keep it cool. But also, if you want to just be able to study or read or get an education, you have to have a way to be able to turn on the lights. And so this is providing that connectivity to people that have never had that access before and have had to travel to try to get a place just to charge their phone or a little itty bitty solar pack. Now they can have it in their homes. And surprisingly, a lot of people get televisions and are super excited that they can watch television at home for once. And what's really cool about their microgrid systems and off-grid systems, because really, this isn't a microgrid. Um, if anyone knows, this is actually a nanogrid. We don't use that term as much, but this is what I, I'd like to call it as a nanogrid, because it's essentially not tying into any other system outside of just the structure itself. And so what they found out, because they were monitoring these systems, so all of their systems that are out in the Navajo Nation are actually connected through satellite, and they monitor them all the time. And what they discovered after they had plugged it in was that people were actually getting onto their system in order to get internet because somehow they figured out they could. Of course, us ingenu ingenuitive Indies, yeah. You know, we always figure it out. Um, but so now in their next installation round, they're going to include that access uh, to the broadband so that it will now provide that capability via satellite to people who are very remote. And this is something that can be done you know, again, across Indian country, Navajo Nation, I think we think is very prominent, but there are tons of people across Indian country that don't have access to electricity and don't have access to internet. I know, Mark, you, you, you're trying to bring that as well. You know, in order to get access to internet, you also have to have that electricity. So it kind of goes hand in hand with each other. But I just found this to be an amazing project because it was one that I could really see make a, a huge difference on the people's lives immediately with those CARES Act funding. And this directly impacts the citizens. It wasn't like, oh, it went to the tribe. It went to the tribal citizens whose lives are now forever changed because of this ability to access the electricity. Oh, and also just for a little bit, the system has a three-day battery backup as well. So it, if they don't get solar for a little bit, it's still there in the battery backup. And it, again, is really just intended for like appl small appliances and those types of things, uh, not for HVACs. So again, just another little picture of what it is. Okay, and so this is a little chart that goes over their systems of how it works. Um, you know, the other thing that this really relieved, and I don't think we talk enough about this when we talk about utilities and providing energy to people, is that this relieved a burden of cost for people off of them because before they were running generators, so they're having to pay for gasoline all the time. It's not something that you can generate yourself. So by relieving that cost off of people, they're now bringing the ability for them to go out and maybe have some extra money to either entertain themselves or to purchase organic foods, which can be very costly. Um, so these types of services to our tribal citizens directly impact their lives in ways that we really can't quantify so much, but we can see the dollar impacts on how it affects their pockets and their income as well. So another project I'm really excited about, and uh, I might have to segue away from my slides a little bit because, again, we don't talk enough about this. And given what we just saw with the sustainable, um, the small business credit initiative, I think it's really important. We really need to promote more entrepreneurs in our communities. We focus a lot on promoting tribal businesses. And don't get me wrong, I think that tribal businesses are important. But in my experience, trickle-down economics doesn't work very well. And so by supporting tribal entrepreneurs, you are supporting your tribe. You're supporting other businesses that will generate that money. So just for instance, I get paid by tribal clients. You all can look at my outfit. I have already circulated this money three times in our economy. But just for a statistic, 80% of our dollars as they come in immediately go out to non-tribal people because we don't hire tribal businesses to do the work. So that money immediately leaves our economy. But in order to be a sustainable economy, we have to have that money circulate seven times before it leaves. So one of a great way that Bailey Walker 
If you all aren't familiar, Bailey Walker is out of Oklahoma. He's the president of the American Indian, Cha or, sorry, Chamber of Commerce for Oklahoma. Almost screwed that up. Um, and Bailey Walker pretty much took it upon himself to create this trade commission going on with Australia. So he organized a delegation to come from Australia in order to take them around Indian country and show them all the potential of trade partners. And what was really interesting out of this story is we used to trade with Australia. The Aboriginal people in Australia have stories of us trading with them before colonization. So there are old trade routes that they have stories of that we've pretty much forgotten in this country. I know some of us know we had trade routes through our country and through Mexico and Canada, but I don't think we know enough about those trade routes that were going on beyond this continent. And they do, they remember that. So he took it upon himself to, to initiate this um, trade delegation. And really what they're trying to do is encourage economic growth and gross domestic product. You know, we can only grow our economy so much if we don't look at exporting. And there's been a big push around the government as well to look at exporting opportunities. Just in America enough, we've seen that when we only import and import and import, it is not a great thing for our economy. So we actually have to look at ways that we can export our services. And this is one of the ways that Bailey has started is by trying to create this trade delegation. So they signed an MOU with uh, the Australia Trade Commission, and they took this amazing delegation all over Indian country. And then in reciprocity, they took their delegation from Indian country over to Australia, and they went around and toured a bunch of the different Aboriginal communities in Australia in order to create those relations. Because I think we've said it again and again at this, this conference, like relationships are key when it comes to business. Um, one very wise woman once told me that business gets done between people, not between businesses. And so creating those relationships really helped to inspire more business and trade to go on amongst us. Okay, so this last slide, I'm definitely gonna go on a tangent on and I apologize, um, or the last few slides. But uh, I do own a sustainable design company, so really when it comes to design, this is truly my passion because for us to achieve the renewable go uh, goals, particularly when it comes to energy, is we have to start talking about the design of the buildings and the design of our communities. When it comes to the master planning of our communities, I know we talked about that with the energy projects, but it really has to go beyond that. It's gotta talk about the entire master planning of all of these facilities and how they interplay. You can set up power purchase agreements, all those things amongst your own tribal communities and facilities um, to help, again, release some of that economic burden. We're always talking about how under funded our governments are, but we're not taking the opportunity to really look at how we could relieve some of those uh, burdens of the uh, um, operational costs through better design. So Sam Albuquerque, which is the only American Indian architect in Minneapolis, so just for those of you who have thought about going into architecture, we really need more native architects, like desperately need more native architects. There aren't enough of, well, I'm not an architect, I get to call myself a designer, but there aren't enough architects out there, let alone native architects. And it really makes a difference when it comes to how people approach a building and how people approach the community and the layout. Because the reality is, is that we've spent the last 50, 60 years expecting our environment to adapt to us and as you can see, it's not working very well. We really have to go back to our traditional knowledge where we adapted to our environment um, through multiple pictures we've seen you know, across our country. People design their buildings differently based off their climates. People had different foods based off of that. And in the last 60 years, we've just kind of gone to a monolithic uh, usage of buildings and design of buildings. And really because of the cheap advent of energy and, elect and air conditioning, we've moved away from talking about how you can sustainably design communities and buildings. So Sam's been doing some great work up in Minneapolis and across the nation, if you all are looking for an architect to come in and master plan. And uh, two of the things he's been working on is uh, preserving sacred sites. So it's important, a lot of us have them, a lot of us don't wanna tell people where they are, but you know, it comes up and uh, we need to make efforts to 
to really position those in a, a way that we can carry on that knowledge and not allow people to necessarily exploit the, the area. And then also he's the architect who has been redoing the Minneapolis Indian Center. So I know Native Learning Center had actually featured that building. And uh, so I was really excited to get to talk to him a little bit about the work that he's been doing. So why is it important that you have Native people designing our communities that we live in? It's because they think about things such as like, how is our culture going to be reflected within this building? And we don't have to keep explaining it to outsiders how our culture is. They already have some understanding and basic understanding of what that culture is. But they also start to think about things like indigenous landscape and also how that inspires the building and how you can make that building fit within the landscape, bless you, as opposed to being totally, um, you know, kind of, obtuse to the landscape, if you will. So part of the things that he's looked at also is indigenous plants. I know I spoke with one woman here. They were talking about planting shade trees. Awesome idea. Maybe also for all of you, consider planting food trees as opposed to ornamental trees. You know, this again goes back to the food. So if you can put those resources into landscaping and putting those resources into growing a tree, why not get something out of it? There are things that you can do with other trees, um, but just basics of providing food and stuff into our communities. Not to mention when we use more indigenous plants to that area, those plants are there for a reason in that sense. They do things for the environment that we are only just now starting to comprehend really in the Western world about why indigenous plants for those communities are so important. So, ending on the planning and building for futures, future benefits, uh, I really would like to talk about water for a second. I know I didn't include it in the slide, but I know a lot of you all heard me ask the questions about water and why I'm so passionate about it. So I have another swag from my company. Uh, if someone can tell me what gray water and catch water is. So if I'm thinking it right, gray water is like st the water that comes off from like storm water and goes through like the different, um, basically just the urban or whatever like area you're in. And that's like it, but with that, it gets all whatever contaminants are from that, that environment, right? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> that's, I really appreciate your initiative. <laughs> for interacting. Can anyone else tell me what gray water is? Okay. Yes, and for landscaping. So you all would be shocked at how many classrooms I've been in for architecture and design and for sustainability, and nobody knows what gray water is. No one, does anyone know what catch water is? Yes, yes, absolutely. Traditional knowledge. You know, people in the deserts were collecting water for a long time, and there have actually been policies in place to try to cut us off from the water. In Colorado, it was illegal for a long time to catch water off of your roof. Reason for that, right? Because if you can control the water, you can have to force people onto a grid and onto a utility system, which then you can control. So, water, Huge, huge when it comes to our sovereignty, huge when it comes to sustainability. Um, while I was sitting here, I kind of looked up a cost-benefit analysis of gray water. So for those of you who run tribal utility authorities, there's really some economic benefit to you. And for people who are in energy, really some economic benefit. There was a study done out in LA that demonstrated that even if just 10% of the LA water users would implement gray water into their systems, that that would reduce the treatment energy needed by 43,000 um, megawatt hours per year. So that's, that's huge when it comes to consumption. And that's just 10% of people implementing it in the LA area. Also that goes down to 2% usage and reduction in overall use of the water. 
So that can be really big. And when it comes to the single family usage, every day on average, we're all flushing about 40 gallons of potable, drinkable water straight down the toilet, just completely gone. Then we go and treat it, and then we say we don't have enough water, or in some places we do, but not enough potable water. Um, so by implementing a gray water system into some of the buildings and into the homes and into the, the multifamilies, what they discovered in LA is that by doing that, it, they would reduce the usage of a single family home by 27% of that water demand. And that's potable drinking water that we're all having to treat and, and conserve. And in a multifamily building, we're talking about a 38% reduction in demand of potable drinking water. So that directly affects your tribal utility authorities when it comes to the cost for operations and treatment, and it directly affects our energy consumption. So I really, really wanna encourage you all to really start thinking about water in ways and how it affects our sustainability, because as we defined at the beginning, you know, there are three key things to survival. It's food, water, shelter. And if we're not taking into consideration water when we're designing and planning out these things, then we're kind of missing the boat. Um, so it will economically benefit you all to start talking about gray water in that way and to allow for systems like catch water. Um, I know that here in Orlando, they've been implementing that a lot. So they got uh, the Coca-Cola company to donate a whole bunch of, of their old syrup barrels and they went out and they donated them into the community in order to just encourage people to catch the water off, it, off the roofs as it came down and then to use that water for the landscaping. Really basic way that you can implement catch water into your communities but if you go even further, then you can tie in a gray water system so you can reduce that usage into the toilets and then you can still use that water to go out and landscape not for um, edible plants, but for ornamental plants. You can totally landscape around the area using it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. I got through that really quickly. I was afraid I was gonna talk way too long about these things because I get really passionate. But does anyone have any questions about some of these things? Okay, we got a question over here. I just want to uh, follow up with you talking about Sam and his uh, full circle and uh, don't go rushing to him because we're using him right now. So, <laughs> you know, he's great. And That's we're going to we need keep more him. architects. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but no, it, the, the, what he brings to the project is amazing. And we're doing a whole revitalization project with him that's going to take years. So give it five years and then use him. Oh. <laughs> Or bring more business to him so he can hire more native architects because one of the barriers, thank you, thank you. One of those barriers to architects is actually the training. Uh, so I'm a lawyer. I don't normally put that hat on in, in presentations, but the training that goes into being a lawyer is nothing compared to being an architect. Not only do you have to get a bachelor's to be an architect, but then you have to go through years of apprenticeship in order to even sit for the exam. And that's actually where we're seeing a massive barrier in trying to get people to follow through on becoming licensed architects is because they don't get that opportunity to do the internships. Again, because we seem to keep hiring non-native design companies and they don't necessarily hire our native interns to come in and give them that possibility and opportunity to get the training so that they can sit for the exams. So please actually do hire more of Sam's firm so that he can bring in these interns so that we can get more people that truly understand some of these traditional concepts and this traditional knowledge because this is all traditional knowledge when it comes to design. We're just using modern technology to do it at this point. Thank you. No, thank you. Thanks. Hey, this, was an, this was an amazing presentation, and I want to thank you so much for the passion that you bring to it uh, relative to hiring A&E firms, right? Maybe that's something where you can bring your tarot in and say, you know, maybe do an internship through the high school or something like that to expose these young people to that trade so that they can get that knowledge. And I think now is the time because there's so much money, but... Thanks. And thank you, Vicki, for that comment. Just to extend that further, I don't think we apply tarot enough to professionals. Everyone wants to talk about tarot when it comes to construction. No one wants to talk about it when it comes to hiring the lawyers, when it comes to hiring the accountants, when it comes to hiring the architects. Somehow it just goes out the door when it comes to those professions. 
but we've all really been encouraging people to go get educations. And what's the point if we can't get jobs afterwards trying to serve the communities that told us to go get the education in the first place? It's again about providing that opportunity and that ability to people because I know I've heard it a lot here at this conference, don't hire people who don't have the experience, but it's kind of like that first job out of college, right? Everyone's like, oh, you gotta have two to three years experience. Well, how are you ever gonna get the experience if no one's ever gonna give you that opportunity to do it? Thank you, Vicki. Can you uh, talk a little more on the uh, code challenges uh, behind uh, gray water usage and things like that as well? Yeah, I would love to talk about that. <laughs> when it comes to Indian country, as many of you all know, the regulations are in our hands. We have the ability to set that policy. I was actually sitting with a tribal client talking about gray water and I said, well, who would write that code? And they were like, oh, that, that's our department. And I was like, oh, great. So what are you doing with that code? Nothing. So the reality is that California has really set the stage for the entire country when it comes to gray water. They've implemented a code. Florida just recently implemented a code. Arizona implemented a code, but for some reason, nobody wants to follow it because the health department somehow has some reason to say that it's not that use, useful or has some health concerns, which I think is just a fallacy. Um, so when it comes to Indian country, we have the ability to write these codes. Thank you, Pilar for doing that um, and setting those regulations that can implement the gray water, that can allow for catch water. I mean, you don't even really have to write a code to go out and catch water off of your roof. But when it comes to the gray water, having that implemented through a code will set the standard for your community. Because it's one thing to write a code, but it's quite another if you never enforce it. Any other questions? Comments? Concerns? One in the Everyone's front? Okay, right here. Well, snaps for claps because I love all of this and that's what like I usually go to school. Well, I've been in a program, it's called Indigifuse and that's like indigenous food, energy, water, sovereignty, um, security. And so I was just wondering like for upcoming professional or like upcoming um, tribal or sorry, upcoming indigenous architects, art planners, designers, how would you um, say for your experience, I don't know if you had like been able to work with your own tribe, um, just cause like what you're talking, yeah, what you're saying is like, usually that opportunity is not even always there. Like, I guess if you just have like any tips or ways that you were able to kind of get that experience, cause I know that it's sometimes difficult to get in contact with people like who know about all these like TEK or like, yeah, the knowledge sets and like what you're talking about, like water infrastructure has been around for like the longest time by indigenous people. And like, you can see it just by like urban areas, like these things don't work, like concrete doesn't absorb anything and doesn't block anything. So like, I'm just wondering like how you're able to get some of that experience and like talk to people or is it just like really just trying to do that? That's a great question, thank you. Um, and thank you for the work that you're doing and the education you're getting. Um, so in reality, my story I think is the same story as a lot of the business owners that I've heard in this room, which is I couldn't get work with a lot of the tribes. Again, with that, oh, she doesn't have a track record, despite the fact that my business partner is a licensed architect with 30 years of development and building. In fact, he just worked on the Hannaville Potawatomi's um, new casino edition with a water park, 13 stories. So total track record with business, like reputable partners. Um, but yet everyone kept saying, you know, for some reason they kept hiring all the other architecture and design firms. Um, so I actually ended up getting that experience going out of Indian country. And that's really sad that as professionals, that's what we have to do is go outside of Indian country. And unfortunately when it comes to sustainability, the people who can really afford it right now are the upper echelons of the economy. So I, I had to go and design rich people's homes and talk to people who had the money to put it where their mouth was when it came to sustainability. Um, and with, you know, we've all heard about this amazing funding that's coming down the pipeline. Like, it's great if we get these projects in. 
it's not so great if you don't hire native companies to do it because then again that money is just coming in creating something and going right back out the door to other people who aren't going to come in and buy our products who aren't coming to our powwows and supporting our vendors who aren't going to our restaurants and eating those foods or buying from the farms and so these things really do matter and it's almost biblical in that sense. And you know, it says in the Bible that you're not necessarily a prophet among your own people, that you have to go to another community. But that's almost lateral violence that we continue to perpetuate amongst ourselves, where it's like, if we would just give ourselves the opportunity for the people who we've encouraged to go get these educations, then maybe we wouldn't have to be doing work outside of Indian country. We could focus it all in Indian country and have that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, can we have a big round of applause for Tata? <clears throat> she represents, I forgot to mention, she represents Kiowa Tribe, okay, and um, an excellent representation, I must say. So thank you very much, thank you. Tata, thank you. All right, so that brings us to our close, okay? So um, of course, first and foremost, as our audience, I'd like to thank you all, you know, for extending um, or for accepting our invitations and uh, flying and traveling from all of the various parts of the country that you all, you, you know, are visiting us from. But I also wanted to take a moment and first and foremost, thank our chairman, Marcella Sassiola Jr., for spearheading this uh, conference, this annual conference, and also um, the, ch uh, the council and the board of the Seminole Tribe for, for hosting us. Can we have a round of applause for them? Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, all right. And we will keep the, the round of applause going. I'd like to extend a very, um, Big thanks to my team here um, of the Native Learning Center, uh, starting with our executive director, Georgia Palmer Smith. Can we have a round of applause? Yes. Our deputy director, Kyle Doni. Okay. Our very so helpful, um, our uh, facilities ladies, uh, Julie and Mata. Very helpful. Extremely helpful. They they literally do anything we ask, literally, and they do it with a smile, and they're so gracious, and we really appreciate having them on our team as well. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, thank our office manager, Gaylene Jacobs. We got a big round of applause for her. Yes, for all the food. She's, she's um, well, to me, she's our Swiss Army knife. She does catering. She does clerical. She does calendars. She books travel. She does it. You name it, she can do it. Um, compliance. Oh, my oh my goodness. The list goes on and on and on, but she's amazing. Um, I'd like to thank our marketing coordinator, Louis Porter Jr., all of the lovely graphics that you that you've seen for the conference, the the flyers, uh, the agendas, anything that's uh, a picture, he's probably behind it, you know. So, um, and he's 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 brilliant. He's a wizard. Um, so we want to thank Lewis Porter Jr. as well. Thank you, Lewis. <laughs> Last but not least, this is my goat. She doesn't know I call her my goat. Goat is an acronym for greatest of all time, by the way. But she is the greatest, um, Awista Atkins. If we could have a, gr a big, big, big round of applause for her. <laughs> Throughout the conference, I kept telling folks that um, she really is the one running the show. It's not me. I'm not. I just got here. I'm not running. I just showed up. I didn't do anything, but my team, they were, um, you know, essential for putting on this great presentation or this great conference over the last two and a half days. And um, I wanted to just take a moment and thank you all for being so great, being so supportive. Thank you very, very, very much. Yes. Yes. And with that, th with that said, I'd like to, um, you know, send you all off, safe travels.
Um, you know, stay in contact with us. We're always available via email. If you want to pick up the phone, give us a call. If you're interested um, in be becoming a, a facilitator as far as like an instructor or trainer with the department, um, you may get in contact with me or any member of my team, and we'd be happy to work with you. So thank you very much. Please stay in town if you can for the powwow, for the 50th annual, annual powwow this weekend. But if you have to go, safe travels to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes.